Hello, everyone. I am Corey Andrew Powell, and I'm joined today by Alyssa Bassist, editor of the Funny Women column on The Rumpus and author of the award-deserving memoir, Hysterical. She teaches humor writing at the New School, Catapult, 92nd Street Y, Lighthouse Writers Workshop, and more. And the prominent signature of Elisa's work is her ability to find the funny and even the hardest of times as a way of coping and healing. So, Alyssa, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. And let me just first (laughs) tell you that when I first read your name and I read this funny quote about Taylor Swift, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so great. This is um, Taylor Swift's bassist. Like that's what I saw when I first (laughs) saw (laughs) you. So moral moral of the stories do not read quickly when you're trying to book guests on a podcast. Yes, Um, I say on my website that I'm the literary equivalent of Taylor Swift. And and my yes, last name yes. is spelled bassist, so I can understand the misunderstanding. Thank you. It's not too far off. Although I have to say, I do see a bit more of a Lisa Loeb vibe happening. But um, thank you. That is the greatest compliment. I've always been going for Lisa Loeb since birth. <laughs> She's totally and you keep, and you keep getting Taylor, name. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was she was pretty awesome. She was pretty awesome. So before we begin, I want to actually first start talking about uh, your wonderful memoir. Your 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 I guess it's a memoir. It's a book that you. It's about your experiences. Um, but I do want to ask first: Do you actually do stand up or more comedy writing? I'm not brave enough to do stand up. Um, I have done improv and sketch. Thank you. And I watched a lot of Seinfeld growing up. And that's, <laughs> Me too. Yeah, that's all my um, experience in professional comedy, though it's pretty amateur. Um, I happen to host a lot of literary events, literary readings, and I come off as very funny in comparison. Well, you're very funny in general, even just reading. That's why I ask because I know that you use comedy in your writing, and also, as I mentioned, as a healing tool, very often to even address trauma. But um, the things I was reading, like laughing out loud, at just some of the things as I was researching you, and um, I happen to uh, do comedy, and my idols were all women who inspired me <laughs> to do it. Like in the who, wait, who? early '90s. Oh gosh, well, Susie Essman was like one of my all-time favorites. Uh, people forget that Ellen DeGeneres was a brilliant stand-up comedian before she became Ellen. And my all-time favorite, though, really, I have to say, who actually inspired me. I met her on the street corner like three days before I was about to do my first stand-up. And I was about to bail because I lied to the owner to tell him I had done it. I was like, oh, yeah, I did Boston. I did all the clubs. And I you lied. have to lie. That's and, normal. Uh, you have to. Yeah. yeah, they don't let you in. Um, and I get to the corner, and there's Janine Garofalo just standing there i mean at that point to me she just was and is she just was everything so you know she literally was like yeah just if you can handle like nothing no sound at a punchline if you can handle that <laughs> go for it so i was like i was gonna guess um, you anyway. to janine garofalo that was my guess oh uh, was it <laughs> she, i, just, I well, feel like she's guess. so often around she does so much stand up all over the place and she's also so approachable Mm-hmm. I've run into, really I've been lucky enough to run into her a few times, and what a delight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's an actual great person, and not to make this like the Janine Garofalo hour, but what was so weird was that I was on a street corner in the village, like right on Christopher Street and something, and I saw her, and as I go to approach her, uh, an Italian tourist who doesn't speak any English, who doesn't know who she is at all, just jumped between us and says, I'm trying to go to... Uh, and he's trying to like, and so Janine and I for like 25 minutes are trying to talk broken Italian in Spanish, mind you, to this tourist. <laughs> and and, and Janine begins to write like a map on a napkin for him. Like, okay. She's like, Aries on Quattro Street. I'm like, Janine, this is not. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but it was such a good story. So hopefully Janine, if you're out there listening, um, yeah, thank you. It was a great, it was a great moment. I'm glad you guys are so generous. But back to you. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Back to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a reason why we had you on today as a guest. So uh, as I was saying to you before we began to record, you are literally a treasure trove of so many references. So you're like an interviewer's dream. Um, but I want to begin with your book, Hysterical. So just share with us why you actually wrote that book and, and what is it about? Well, I started the book a mere 12 years ago. 
And uh, so it took me 11 years only to write it and to publish it. And I really wanted to be famous. And I thought my vehicle to fame would be to write a book of nonfiction. Um, and I thought that only because I really loved reading. And to me, those were the most popular people in my heart were authors who told the truth. And um, so I really aspired to that. But at the same time, I felt like I didn't have anything to say and nobody would care. And so I had to spend many years getting over that and figuring out how to make people care about what I had to say. And I also had to grow up and live a lot more life to write about it. And I ended up writing about the topics I knew well, which were limited to my ex-boyfriend. So I wrote and wrote about him to him. He didn't want me to do that anymore. So then I wrote more about him. And then I was writing about another ex-boyfriend. I um, very prolific in the ex-boyfriend writing about territory. Um, and I was also interested so very much in representation in media and sexism in real life and misogyny and all of the forces conspiring against women to hold us back, quiet us, and make us be ashamed of our emotions, um, like my ex-boyfriends were doing to me. So, yeah, I... that's the Taylor Swift reference, by the way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was yeah. Taylor Swift before Taylor Swift was born. I just didn't have <laughs> any singing talent or songwriting talent um, or much <laughs> talent in general. So, um, yeah. <laughs> She then needed to get born and um, run so that I could walk. And I did say that. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah. Well done, Taylor Swift. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Taylor Swift and to Janine Garofalo. <laughs> um... <laughs> then... Right. They gave birth to both of us. Sorry. I know. Go yes, ahead. they did. They, they did. I do. Yeah. I honor and love them so very much. I hope they listen <laughs> to Motivational Mondays. And oh, well, we're going to make sure they do. We're going to make sure they do. But yeah. please, I'm sorry, I keep interjecting. So please continue. <laughs> Typical. Walk all over my voice. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Be nice. Thanks for disproving my point that it exists. I love like anytime anybody says anything negative about my book, I can just be like, that's because of sexism. It's just proving my point that sexism exists. <laughs> yeah. It's a and built people in. are being yeah, totally built in. <laughs> And you and you might not be you know you might not be too far off the mark though because I, I didn't don't think read. I know wrong. Well, not in this book's case. I'm going to tell you that part because I was reading. I'm like, oh my gosh, like yeah, you were nailing it, especially because your whole platform is about the silencing of women's voices, and it's, it's in all aspects. So you're talking about just sort of tongue in cheek about the boyfriend, but you know you really make a bigger connection to bigger issues like body autonomy and just having a voice uh, when you have a point to make, but people are then making you out to be difficult, which is, you know, that word that rhymes with stitch. Um, so, so that's pretty much an overall arching thing. So you may not be off the mark. I don't know if men will like what you have to say in this, but it's true. I think it is true. The good ones, the good ones do. And you're right. So I, I started out my ex-boyfriends, but that's certainly not where it ended. Um, I had noticed so many other situations that had connected to my ex-boyfriends or that exemplified what my ex-boyfriends were showing me in relationships. And I knew that to make people care about my experience was to connect it to experience at large and the society that the society in which we're reacting to and experiencing within. And I, in the middle of writing the book, got very sick and gave up writing the book and had one goal only, which was to survive. Spoiler alert, I did. But I had noticed in doctor's offices, I was experiencing the same sexism, the same silencing, and the same self-silencing that I experienced at work and in relationships and on the street. And I was like, this is too big to be a coincidence. And I wonder not just about 
like our attitudes about, um, I guess I should say I was really not, not so much interested in like the gender of the doctors or the employers or the partners. It was more about their perception of women and how they just didn't think anything we had to say had to be listened to or believed or um, validated in any kind of way. And I hated that. So I had to write all about it. In the hospital situation, for example, you were explaining what you were feeling or what you were going through. Like literally, like physically, here's what's happening to my body. And they're sort of like, no, that's not really what's happening. They're sort of talking down to you. <laughs> and I mean, so share a little bit, if you can, about like the specifics of like what, how they made you feel in that context. Yeah, so they just really diminished my experience and my reporting of my own experience. So they would essentially say, like, you're not in the pain that you're in. It can't possibly be that much pain. You're an unreliable narrator of what's going on in your own body. The pain, if I were in it, wouldn't be that bad. It shouldn't be that bad. It can't be that bad. And there's really nothing wrong. Like the sentence I heard over and over again was, there's nothing wrong with you. Even though there was clearly something very wrong with me. And most of the time I was right. I had a fatal blood disease. I had, um, that's called hyponatremia. I had a herniated disc. I had side effects from medication that were giving me what presented as a headache, but it was like really giving me muscle and nerve damage. Like there was a lot that was wrong, but they either didn't believe me, didn't want to hear it, didn't want to figure it out, didn't think that my pain was valid. And it was really difficult because at the same time, I believed what they believed like and I didn't want to annoy them and I didn't want to pretend that I knew better than them I didn't want to be the expert and authority on my own body because they're doctors they went to medical school they're playing god they know everything I know nothing I know my place and so I wasn't willing to advocate for myself or fight for myself or in any way like annoy frustrate aggravate them by asking them to do their job. Wow, that is so deep because, I mean, it there is a direct correlation as you were saying that, well, we're talking about a medical context. So of course there's a direct correlation between women's body and their choice to do what they want with their body, which is amazing that we're in a position now where the ability to even have that control is like on the ballot, right? For le being legislated um, that, and there's politicians who will remain uh, nameless, but you can Google. There are politicians who say things like, this choice is, is between lawmakers and the judge. Like, you're like, no, it's between the woman and her doctor. Like, what? Like, there's people who are actually voicing that. So why do you think at this point, I mean, this is a million dollar question, but why do you think that's not gotten better from the, I mean, this is these are arguments that were going on since before we were born, and here you are facing them still with women being treated this way any i mean there's no wrong or right answer but any idea or thought behind why this it's so pervasive and continues yes i know the right answer it's because we're experiencing a backlash i mean the more power we get the more power will our power will be questioned and restrained and um we're scary Having autonomy is scary. Having um, power and agency is scary to other people because they think if we have some or an equal amount that they have less and their math is just wrong. And um, I started working on this book in 2010 and I was really worried that it was no longer going to be relevant in a year or two. And it kept being relevant, if not more relevant as the political climate changed. And that was really great for selling my book, but really bad for everyone in the world. And I would just see that we would make progress in one area and then there would be a backlash to it. And it's like one of those like um, one step forward, two steps back situation. 
And I think there's just always going to be a group in power that wants to remain in power and they'll do anything, say anything, lie to retain that power. And in that same vein of thinking, you do talk about dismantling the patriarchy. And it is specifically, I mean, I mean, if we're going to keep it real, it's, you know, it's white male. <laughs> it's like white males are the patriarchy of um, the foundation of this country anyway. I mean, it may be different than others, but yeah, mostly here in Europe. Um, and what you just said is funny because it's aligned with many groups who are marginalized are having that same battle. And it's that same thing. It's this idea of, well, if we give, well, I'm not saying all white males. Let me just make sure I clarify. But, you know, the ones who are trying to retain to that power, as you mentioned, there's this hysteria on their end of if I give someone just equal parts, equal share, equal value, then somehow I'm losing the dominance. And so we see that with every marginalized group, including women, minorities, ethnic groups. So very pervasive. I don't know how we you know, you, like I said, you talk about dismantling it, but are there any ideas on how we ever can do that? That's, it's so difficult to answer because the power dynamics are so entrenched and a lot of us are not aware of them. And the forces against us are so often invisible and so ever present. And it involves undoing like lifetimes of socialization. And it involves getting all the white men on our side or a majority of them. And I totally agree. It's hashtag not all men. But as a group, this like entity called the white man, um, they, their fear becomes hatred and it's so unchecked. And that's scary. So dismantling it is hard. I think it starts with you and it starts with awareness of these forces. And I tried to call out as many as possible in the book because they're everywhere. These forces are why we shave our legs. It's why we silence ourselves. It's why we suppress our emotions. It's why we would rather be sick than speak out against our sickness be for fear of someone not loving us or fear of retaliation or something like that. Um, so awareness is really important of everything that's going on and, and giving voice to your feelings and frustrations about it. A lot of people don't want us to do that. And they use the courts to ensure that they use this like pervasive sense of fear that if you talk out, you will be sued, you will be hurt, you will be dumped, you will be fired. And I think a lot of that is bullshit. Am I allowed to say bullshit? You, yes, you can, yes. <laughs> we'll bleep it out later. <laughs> I think a lot of it is an empty threat. For sure, there is a lot of violence for people who, who say no, and I acknowledge that violence and the statistics in the book, and it is a very real thing to be afraid of. People are very angry. We see hate crimes every day, domestic terrorism all the time. Um, but I think overall on our, in our everyday lives, speaking up for ourselves, and it's like small, just um, saying to a flight attendant, like, may I get some extra water? I mean, these are like small acts that I find my own self afraid of doing. Cause like, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to cause a scene by asking for extra water. <laughs> like these just like ingrained teeny tiny fears that add up. Um, I think we can work on that and on saying no more when we're thinking no and apologizing less and taking up more space and saying what we're thinking because i know we're all thinking i'm not comfortable with that that is something i don't want to do for free um and voicing those unsaid thoughts more for me helps me feel more powerful and that i'm an agent of my own life and that i can advocate for my health and telling doctors that doesn't make me comfortable can we come up with another solution 
um, leaving situations where you're not feeling heard and not feeling guilty about leaving, not feeling like you're hurting someone's feelings for protecting your own. These, um, again, are these small acts that we have not been trained to do and they feel minor, but they're important and they feel alien, but we have to like sort of go against that. And if the more individuals feel power and feel like they are people whose voice should be heard and not just tolerated, but, but accepted. Like, I feel like that's how you begin to dismantle the patriarchy by empowering like one person at a time to speak up for themselves. Right. With a very genuine intention of bringing them in, not just as a token. Cause then you have, you have that whole thing. Now everyone's talking about, Oh, diversity and inclusion. I'm like, well, that doesn't mean you just check a box. Okay. We got three Chinese, four black, two white, we did it. Right. Like that's not what that means. That means you bring in those various voices, whether they be women or different minority groups and give them a seat at the table so they can actually share. And also, as you were saying that it was, it sparked a memory. Uh, I was watching one of the forensic shows. I'm like obsessed with them. And one was like a, an FBI profiler. And I don't know what the statistics were, but she had this, um, this number of how many women have been attacked by someone a stranger and they actually felt someone walking behind them a few paces back and they didn't want to cross the street because they didn't want the person who they don't know this person who they don't know they didn't want that person to perceive them as being um mis misjudging them yeah and so they just continue walking with like this psycho like michael myers 10 feet behind them versus just cross the street i mean <laughs> just cross yeah. the street and it was similar to what you said. There's like this internalized sort of like passiveness because that's how they're programmed. Yes. And that's like the, the grip, the death grip that fear has on us, that we don't act in our own best interest because we have this outsized fear of hurting someone else, aggravating someone else, doing something wrong. And so we will stay in a bad situation because we're afraid that leaving it or saying something about it will be the thing to hurt us when it's the thing that saves us. And I also wanted to point out when you're talking about offering a seat at the table is not enough. I couldn't agree more. It's not just about numbers and inclusion. It's about like validating other people's perspectives and stories as worthy of attention and as like, as expert, as, like giving the accolades and the respect that we give to white male stories, giving that to other marginalized communities. So it's not just including them, but validating them. Yeah, I just interviewed a woman named Kelly Bonner. She's this amazing, um, well, she does a lot of work with the government, part of the Biden administration for going into businesses, uh, mainly federal jobs and implementing programs to reduce workplace violence. And um, at the same time, she's also a burnout expert, which is kind of, you know, kind of an interesting thing. But, but she talks about, you know, the same thing is like when women, for example, um, are afraid to say they need to go take a medical leave or you know, I, I've heard these sort of consistent things from women. So, you know, women are afraid to sort of mention where they may have a doctor's appointment, for example, because, you know, they think that someone may look at that and think that they're weak or are they sick or where men are just like, hey, I got to go. And, and no one questions them. And um, or another one, um, Mitzi Short, another author, she's a Pepsi co-exec for 25 years. She just wrote a new book as well. And it's very similar where she and five other women CEOs got together and they shared all these things they've experience along their journey and one of them was the father who's like hey i gotta go uh leave work early on wednesdays take my kid to soccer practice and like everyone's in the office like high-fiving like he's such a good dad oh my god he's such a dad like giving him a parade and everything and then you know the women are almost afraid to say hey i have to take my kid to a soccer game on wednesday it's exactly. just then you're not it's a, it's work amazing. seriously. You're not deserving of a promotion. You're slacking yeah. off. Your priorities mm. are unbalanced. Yeah. 
Yeah, all those things are afraid to even. So I'll just say on behalf of men, I think definitely I'm going to agree with you that we need to do better and be more um, allies in that situation. So hopefully men who are listening to this will realize that women can't do this alone. They need true allies. So hopefully uh, we will inspire that. I do want to ask you um, also, what do you mean when you talk about self gaslighting? <laughs> because, you know, I, I last night is so funny after I was researching you um, like last week and I was preparing tonight, uh, last night. And just so you know, Miriam Webster has voted the word good. <laughs> just so you know what I'm going to I say, right? Alice, Miriam Webster, the, the word of 2022 is gaslighting. I really thought that was the word of 2016, but I'll take it this year. Yeah, well, they sort of, yeah, they perfected it over, yeah. over the past five years. But, <laughs> I've been um, workshopping it and now it's Totally. Hard. Now it's like the epitome of, of the word of the year. Um, I fight with people often in, uh, pol over political conversations, so it's a word that I'm very familiar with. But self-gaslighting, um, uh, that part I'm intrigued by, so share what that means. Well, one impossibility of dismantling the patriarchy is that we have internalized patriarchy. It is so a part of our internal structure, and we have internalized sexism, internalized misogyny, internalized racism. So it's not enough to fight sexism to say you're not racist it is to acknowledge that i have all of this in me because it's how i grew up it's the messages i'm surrounded by it is how i have had conversations for most of my life um so my self gaslighting is i have just internalized all of the messages that say no one cares what I have to say. My voice is annoying. My emotions are repellent. I have to get over all of that in order to write, in order to speak up, in order to feel my feelings and not apologize for them. Self-gaslighting is why women apologize so often because we believe that we shouldn't speak up. We shouldn't interrupt. We shouldn't exist. We shouldn't be in pain. We shouldn't, 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 shouldn't be people because that is how the world sees us. And so that is how we see ourselves. And everything my haters are thinking about me, I'm also thinking about me. Like we're on the same page about how we feel about me. And um, this is why I'm in therapy. And I have to work really hard to talk back to those thoughts that have been programmed in me because it's what I've been hearing all of my life, either directly or indirectly. My stuff, my bosses have said to me that replay in my head that have become my own voice saying them back to me or by messages I see in media, which is that the best woman is the dead woman or the raped woman or the abducted woman. So like we pick up on all of that from the time we're born until five seconds ago and we regurgitate it whether we know it or not. And that's why, again, awareness is step number one to beating all of that. But it's like, my haters have nothing on me. Like the stuff I say to myself is way worse than anything they could ever say to me. Same with my bosses and ex-boyfriends. Like, um, I have them beat. So I have to get over all of that in order to do my work. And I know so many other people, of course, it's not just women, it's every marginalized community. It's probably just anybody who isn't a straight white man who, who believes like he farts gold. Um, and then everybody else is like farts and is like, I'm so sorry. I have a body. <laughs> sorry. My intestinal tract works. My bad. <laughs> Alyssa Bassiste. Bassist. Thank you. Bassist. I, I was so certain I wasn't going to ruin it at the end, but Alyssa Bassist, um, not, ta uh, not Taylor Swift's bassist, not to be confused Unfortunately. with that. And I just want to say, this is a great conversation. And I really appreciate you being here today because women, to me, uh, are the backbone of everything. So I'm not sure why we're still having these struggles, but I'm here with you, my sister. I will support you. And I think you're awesome. Ditto.